Hi guys, Dr. Bishop here. In this video, I'm going to go over understanding the results of a systematic review and meta-analysis. Let's review the case in the article that you found. You are a second year student who is seeing patients at the student-run clinic. You see a 42-year-old woman who wants to know if she should get a mammogram to screen for breast cancer. You came up with this PICO question. In women between 40 and 50, do screening mammograms versus no screening mam mammograms reduce the risk of death from breast cancer? The guideline is a bit confusing, so you decide to review the systematic review that, published, that was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine and that the guideline was based on. You plan on going through the three steps of critical appraisal and have already determined whether you believe that this is a strong or a weak study. Now it's time for us to interpret the results. Systematic reviews come in two forms. Some systematic reviews are qualitative. And others are quantitative. But they all differ from narrative reviews because the authors systematically search the available literature, regardless of whether they do a qualitative assessment or a quantitative assessment. The quantitative assessments are sometimes called meta-analyses. Regardless of how the authors decide to synthesize the results, most systematic reviews report information on each individual study as either a table in the body of the article or as an appendix. Let's look at the mammogram systematic review. In this paper, the authors have an overall summary of the evidence in their table three. They also have a full listing of the papers in an appendix. The authors did do a quantitative meta-analysis of all the data. The purpose of a meta-analysis is to take the results of all the study and create one pooled estimate of the result. When looking at the results of a meta-analysis, we want to know two questions. First, how much variability is there between all of the studies? And second, what are the pooled results? Let's take a look at this first question. If you remember from the introduction video, a systematic review pools evidence from multiple studies and synthesizes that evidence either quantitatively or qualitatively. We discussed the problems that arise when a clinical question is too broad. When looking qu at quantitative results of a meta-analysis, we want to see if there is a lot of variation in the results. If there is too much variation, then the results of the individual studies should not be pooled. There are a number of ways to assess variability. One way is to see whether the confidence intervals for each study overlap. If we look at the article, we can see that all of the results are presented in this figure. This figure is called a forest plot. Forest plots are the standard way of showing data in a meta-analysis. Each study is listed on the left-hand side. Then the results are plotted in the middle. In this study, they also show the raw data from each study on the right-hand side. The boxes here represent the estimated effect and the lines represent the 95% confidence intervals. The estimated effect in this case is the relative risk of dying from breast cancer. You can quickly eyeball the confidence intervals and see that they overlapped. There are no outlier results. You can also see that from the numeric values listed on the right-hand side. There are other, more formal ways to look at variability in studies. These are called formal tests of heterogeneity which is another term for variability. You do not need to know the statistical background of heterogeneity testing, 
but you do need to know what the terms are and how to interpret them. One statistic that is often reported is called the I-squared statistic. What you need to know about the I-squared is that the lower the I-squared, the less heterogeneity there is, which means that's better and there's less variability between the studies. The Cochrane Collaboration has come up with a rough guide for interpreting I-squareds. They suggest that I-squareds from 0 to 40 present minimal heterogeneity. From 30 to 60, it's moderate heterogeneity. And 50 and greater are substantial or considerable heterogeneity. Going back to our checklist, we now want to know what are the pooled results. We discussed earlier how authors often show a table with all the qualitative results of the studies that they included. What about the pooled results in a meta-analysis? The methods for pooling results in a meta-analysis can be very complicated, but in simplistic terms, I like to think about the pooled results as a weighted average of all the results of the individual studies. Again, that's a simplistic interpretation, but it should help you understand some of the statistics behind it. Let's take a look at the article to see if we can find the pooled results. If we go to the article, we can scroll to the relevant subse subsection of the results section and see what the authors say. The authors write, for women aged 39 to 49, eight trials provided data for the meta-analysis. Combining the results, the pooled relative risk for breast cancer mortality for women randomly assigned to mammography screening was 0.85 with a 95% confidence interval of 0.75 to 0.96, which indicates a 15% reduction in breast cancer mortality in favor of screening. At the bottom of the forest plot, there is a diamond which represents the combined relative risk of breast cancer mortality for women randomly assigned to mammography screening. As you can see, it falls to the left of the plot, which means it favors screening and does not cross the relative risk of one. So those are the essential ways that we interpret systematic reviews. Now you know the essentials of interpreting the results of a systematic review or meta-analysis. In class, we'll review these steps and we'll discuss how to apply the results to your own patients.